today. Um, we're gonna cover the tissues packet. So I'll go over that right now. Um, we'll kind of go through what is on the test and then we'll go through any questions you might have. And then I'll also talk about how to complete it for the full amount of points for your homework. So I'll try to kind of break that down. And then we're also going to finish the cell. Um, I just have a little bit of the nucleus, so that won't take too long. And then we want to make sure you guys have a good understanding of mitosis, okay? Um, if we get to it, possibly, we might be able to start meiosis. Um, but the tissues packet, I want to spend a good amount of time on. I might even start talking about some of the tissues today, if everybody likes that idea. So we'll kind of feel that out. Monday of next week. We're going to go over meiosis. Remember, you guys have both um, oogenesis and spermatogenesis. So my goal on Monday is to get through both of those. The oogenesis gets a little complicated. And then hopefully we can touch on some models slash the tissues packet again, because the tissues packet. Um, so today I'll explain how to do it. And then maybe we'll go over some of the tissues, if that makes sense. If you guys haven't started the tissues packet, some of this might feel a little confusing, so I'll do my best to make it clear. Okay, and then Thursday of next week, um, we'll go over uh, probably the basically tissue slash histology, because that is, um, again, another lecture topic. And then Monday of next week will be a review session. So you guys have your lecture exam on the Tuesday, right? Uh, so this would be Monday, and I believe it's the 13th. And your le lecture exam is on Valentine's Day, right? Your first lecture exam for Newton's class. I'm not sure. Um, does someone from Bender's, sorry, it's easier than me trying to find it on my phone. Bender's class, when is your lecture exam? Sorry, I only had time to look up Newton's. Um, Bender is Wednesday. Okay, perfect. So you guys are on the 14th and 15th, right? Because I don't think Knudsen's class is meeting on Monday. So you guys would be Tuesday the 14th and then Wednesday the 15th. Okay. So our Monday session, we'll do a review again. So next week, we're going to be doing meiosis and basically models. Thursday, we'll kind of do tissues and histology. And then Monday will be a review session. So the only lecture I won't be doing is integumentary. I probably won't do integumentary here in SI. So where is that? Right here, integument. I don't know if you guys have watched this yet. It's chapter five. Um, I probably won't have time to do that, but everything else I should be able to get to. So that's kind of the plan. Um, oh, Benders is Monday and Wednesday. Okay, so for those of you who are in Bender's class, basically Monday the 13th, you won't be able, well, actually you could probably come to the review. I'll, I'll try to gear Monday the 13th, maybe a little bit half and half, half lecture stuff for the people taking their lecture exam, and then maybe half lab stuff for the people who are in Bender's class and are preparing to take the lab exam, if that makes sense. So you would take your exam Monday if you're in Bender's class, and then you can come to SI and I'll still be doing tissues for your lab exam review. So I'll do some lab exam review and some lecture exam review, if that sounds good to everybody. So hopefully I can accommodate people who are in Newton's class about to take the lecture exam. You can come for some lecture review. And then people who are in Bender's class that are going to be preparing to take their lab exam, you can come for some lab review. So I'll kind of do a mix. All right. <laughs> um, so reminder, somebody wrote it in the chat, so I cannot record this session. Again, um, my recording app isn't working. Um, I'm not able to record because I don't own the Zoom meeting. So if anybody's recording, that would be great. And you guys can either send it to me um, or you can upload it into the module. I have it editable so you guys can upload it. All right, any other... Um, preliminary questions. And as we all, as I always say, as I'm going along, um, when you guys have questions, just remember to uh, stop me and ask questions, okay? So one of the things I wanted to make sure that I clarify and that you guys have a good understanding of is the models. I know that I talked about it on the first SI session, 
and you guys are probably seeing them in lab. So I'm not like stressed about you guys not knowing what they are, but I think there are some students each semester who kind of fall through the cracks and don't really realize how much we're going to be testing you with the models. So I want to make sure that I show you guys and that we, um, I'll go over not all of them today, obviously, but I'll just show you um, what kind of is expected on that for the test, okay? So, so again, if you're interested in the SI schedule, that would be on the right-hand column. Okay, so for models, your first model on the exam uh, that we'll test you on is going to be the mitosis. Remember to look at your key and then you will look at um, all of those different terms on the actual models themselves, okay? If anybody needs help, remember I have tutoring today 11 to 12. And then other options, since I've already gone over this model, especially in SI, is you guys could label it. Like, for example, one of the best ways I think to utilize me as a resource, since I know that my hours are like limited, um, but I do check my phone and I check my messages from you guys. So if you guys were to take like um, a picture like this on your phone or uh, like print it out somehow or on your iPad, if you guys label this and you guys send me a picture of it labeled, I can tell you if you're right or wrong. Does that make sense? So like, let's say you guys practice labeling this, or again, if you have questions about one item, you guys could always just send it over to me and say, hey, is this, this red arrow is pointing to, what is this pointing to? Does that make sense? So those are kind of ways that you can utilize me as a resource. You can send me a Canvas inbox and then you can say, hey, is the red arrow, arrow pointing to X, Y, Z? What is it pointing to? Okay, so that's kind of a helpful way. Again, I've already gone over these mitosis models here in SI, um, I don't know, a few sessions ago. So the cell, um, I do need to go over that. I haven't gone over that. So that hopefully we'll get to today. Again, if not, maybe I'll get to that on Monday. See, I have models and tissues. So the mitochondria models will be your first model on the exam. We also have your cell model on the exam. We also have this mitochondria model, okay? Again, hopefully I can get to as many of these as possible. Um, before your lab exam. We'll also have the phospholipid bilayer on the lab exam. All of these are lab exam models. We also will cover these tissue models on the exam. The intestine model will be on the exam. Um, the bone model, the different blood cells, the neuron, and then the skin model, okay? So on, sometimes I try to make sure I, I like bring the point home. So on my exam, when I took this class, when I took the lab exam, I had out of all of the models that I just showed you, I had this, this, these models on my exam. I had the cell model on my exam. I don't think I had the mitochondria. I had the phospholipid bilayer. I had one or two of these that you see here. I definitely had this one. I definitely had this one. I had multiple white blood cells. I think I had the right red blood cell. I had a neuron and I had the skin. So out of all 10 of these, I may have been missing maybe the mitochondria. Okay, and the mitochondria is actually the easiest one. Um, it's just like three terms you have to know. So I'm telling you that to say, please don't neglect these. This is a good 20 to 30 questions of your exam. Um, and that's a lot of points, right? So it's not gonna be the majority of your exam. Um, so if you have 50 questions, this might be 10 to 15 to 20 of them, but you know, you're not gonna get a good passing grade if you don't study these, okay? So hopefully everybody's encouraged to study them. Um, just to be very, very clear, the same exact models are on your exam. So we're not going to go into like a random cupboard in a hidden storage closet and find some weird model and then pull it out and ask you to identify. It's going to be the same exact one. So the same exact one that we have pictures of every single time. Good. So it's not like we're not trying to trick you. The models are going to be the same.
any questions on models? So I'm trying to make that clear before we move on to tissues. So the one part of your lab exam is models. Um, where are we to find all of them on Canvas? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so if you go to, are you Vendor or Newton? Newton. Newton. Okay. So for Newton, each week you're going to be following the modules. So for week one, right, you would go to week week two would be last week. And then you'll see them labeled lab exam number one content, meaning it'll be tested on lab exam number one. And then it says mitosis models, the cell model, mitochondria model, and phospholipid bilayer. And then if you if you click those, it takes you to the Google Drive link that looks like this. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, yes. So, Veronica, you asked, is this on Bender's lab exam? Yes, they will all be on Bender's lab exam as well. Again, the teachers, both teachers teach um, like side by side, I guess you could say. They like format their classes the same. So, same models on his exam. Uh, the modules are going to look a little different for his. So, it'll probably be in the lab exam one module. Um, let's make sure that it's published. Lab exam one. So it should be, where are we at? Where are my models here? Unit one lab models, all models linked here. Uh, hopefully you're seeing this, everybody who's taking Bender. And if you go here, mitosis models, cell, mitochondria, phospholipid, intestine, bone, blood, neuron, tissue, skin. So these are all the same links I just showed you at the top. Good? So yes, they are all the same models. Any questions on models? So again, a little recap for lab exam number one, just because I know we talked about this a little while ago. What is tested? So you're going to be getting the 10 models that we just talked about. Um, metric measurements. So you're going to have to weigh, weigh something with a weight boat, measure something with a ruler, um, measure a liquid with a cylinder, um, and also, so that would be all metric conversions from your packet right? Metric, metric conversion. So that was the metric packet. And then the microscope packet, you're going to need to do length and width of a paramecium. Um, and then the parts of the microscope, right? Metric packet, the, uh, sorry, I mean mitosis, those would be the phases of mitosis under a microscope. And obviously the models, but that's, a, the, that's pretty evident. And then the tissues packet we're about to talk about next. This will be about 60% of your exam will be identifying the tissues. Good. So, so far you guys should be feeling pretty good about your metric conversions. You guys should be comfortable doing those and they should be something you're practicing quite a bit for how to do those conversions without a calculator on a piece of paper, right? Your microscope, you should be pretty comfortable with the parts of the microscope gone over those. Length and width of a paramecium, you've practiced that a few times. And then mitosis, you've looked at the phases of mitosis under a microscope and you're getting good at identifying prophase, metaphase, anaphase and telophase under the microscope. All right, so let's talk now about your tissues packet. Any questions at all on, um, any questions at all on that? If you do have questions, just let me know. Need to pull up your tissues packet. I wanna show you guys your resources too that I've made available. So, for your packet, there should be um, a Google Drive link available to, to 
you if you're in Bender or Newton's class. So if you're taking Bender's class, it's going to be in this tissue lab packet link. You'll see it right here. It's a Google Drive link. If you click on that, it will pull up for you guys this link right here. If you're in Newton's class, it's going to be the same thing right next to where you have your tissues lab packet submission. You'll see a Google Drive link in the module, and that will pull up this link here. Okay. So what we've done is we've provided for you guys a, an example for every tissue in the packet from our microscopes in class. So it's not like an example that we just Googled. These are all real examples from our microscope slides that we have in class. So using these, if you guys would like, you guys can actually complete your tissues packet, um, a lot of it at home. Okay, and I'm gonna try to make this as clear as possible. So you can use this Google Drive link if you would like to help you guys complete your packet. However, that will not allow you to be successful on the exam. So just to be really, really clear, I'm telling you guys so that you could maybe get a little bit ahead this weekend. If you'd like, you can use these pictures and I'll show you how to complete the packet. But please, I just want to like try to say I'm telling you that to hopefully help you with time so that you guys can go in next week and spend a lot of time reviewing different examples. If you use these pictures to complete the packet, um, that's not gonna be enough to be successful on the exam because every slide looks different. So we'll just pull up an example and I'll try to make it really clear. So let's, this example, um, this is elastic cartilage and I'll just label it so that we can all kind of see what I'm talking about. So this is elastic cartilage. And everybody's like, everybody's in here like, okay, that's great, that's elastic cartilage. If I just kind of figure out what elastic cartilage looks like, that's good, I can go up to the exam and you know I'll be good. Well, this is also elastic cartilage. And you're kind of like, okay, well, they look pretty similar. One's just gray, one's just pink, like, you know, it's kind of the same idea. The problem comes in when we get to tissues that are more complicated than elastic cartilage. So for example, this tissue is dense elastic, and I'll try to give you guys pointers later on on how to differentiate them, but right now I'm just showing you kind of how it's difficult. So this is dense elastic cartilage that we see, um, dense elastic uh, connective tissue. Okay, so it's not elastic cartilage anymore, it's dense elastic, elastic connective tissue. And this one can look like this, or it can look like this, or it can look like this. And it's like, wait a second, what, how on earth can all three of these be the same thing? And the reason is, is because we actually see this black squiggly line that helps us identify that it's elastic connective tissue. And you can see again here, you actually see that same black squiggly line. And again, repeated here, we see black squiggly lines. So if we look at that, it's like, okay, well, I do actually see how that repeats in each one, this black, dark, squiggly line. But it's not, do you guys see how each of these looks different from each other? So if you guys, for the lab exam, studied just this slide, and you went into lab, you took one look at it, and you're like, oh, okay, well, I can remember that. If you get to the test and I give you guys this one, you're not going to be able to identify it. So you need to spend time in lab not just filling out your packet, like all the questions that I'll show you you have to answer and all the drawings, you need to be spending time looking at different examples. So you need to pull out a microscope slide, look at XYZ tissue. If it's dense elastic, you look at dense elastic. And then you pull out a different microscope slide, maybe from a different uh, box, like a different slide box. And you look at that one. And then you look at a third example and a fourth example. And then you do a different tissue and you look at an example and then a second and a third and a fourth example. So you guys can see how they look differently on different slides. And then you can figure out what is the identifying features that make it look like that tissue, okay? So I know right now it probably feels like, how on earth are we gonna do this? But I will just encourage you, I was able to do it when I was in the class but I was very overwhelmed at first. And the only thing that allowed me to be successful 
on identifying all of them and getting it on the exam was that I spent a lot of extra hours in the lab practicing, looking at the slides over and over again. Um, and I will tell you, this is kind of like an encouragement and a little bit discouraging probably at the same time. This was the hardest exam for me, this lab exam. The tissues part of it was the hardest in the sense that it's really difficult. It's not something that's like, you can just memorize it. You have to like spend a lot of time figuring it out. Okay, so when I'm telling you, look and try to complete your tissues packet, which we're about to go over. When I say do that this weekend, it's so that next week you can go in and look at examples and look at examples and look at examples. Does that make sense? So if you want to get ahead, you could complete your tissues packet this weekend using this Google Drive link so that next week you can just spend time going through example after example after example of each uh, type of tissue so you can start to figure out why they look different from everybody else okay and there is a way to tell with each tissue type and i'll try to go over those in si but it i don't think we'll have time to do all um i believe there's 30 tissues or it's either 25 or 30 different tissues so we don't have time to do all of those today. All right, so hopefully that's making sense to everybody. Um, I want to show you guys this that I have. So in the study resources module. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah. So in terms of the lab exam, you're saying that this is probably going to be the hardest one because the tissues, it's just hard to know how they're going to look. Like, is that what you're saying? That it, there's just so many different examples of it? Yes, because like I said, like for this one, you can see how these three, they look like totally different from each other. Mm -hmm. So if you just went into lab one day and you got kind of behind and you just had time to look at everything once, how are you going to go to the exam and like see a different example and know what that's supposed to be? Does that make yeah. sense? Okay, thank you. That's definitely why. Um, Every exam is hard in its own way. Bones was hard for me because the bone names are very challenging to remember. Uh, the muscles exam, which is the final exam, names made sense. So this, ex this first lecture lab exam, the first lab exam was the hardest because the tissues are very hard to distinguish and it takes a lot of time. The second is hard because of memorization, and the third one is the best for me. So I'm encouraging you in the sense of like, I struggled. Most students I talk to struggle with this first exam. So don't like underestimate it. I'd rather you guys be successful and set up for success by knowing it's going to be challenging than getting to the exam when your grade is already like on the line and then realizing, oh, shoot, this is actually way harder than I thought it was going to be, you know? So if you guys go to that study resources module, which all of you guys should have access to, there is a link here called the tissues checklist for lab exam one. There's also lab exam one practice PowerPoint. <clears throat> so I want you guys to, uh, if you want to right now, that's fine, but I want you guys to take a look at both of those and I will show you how those will help you as you complete your packet. So tissues checklist for lab exam one, let's close these, there's a lot going on. And then the tissues practice PowerPoint. Do we have other questions? I have a question. Um, on the days that we don't have class, we have access to microscopes and slides in the tutoring center, right? Yes, you do. Yes, and I, I highly recommend going in there and taking advantage of that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Brooke, one more question. If we have access to them, does that mean that we also have access to the tissues from class or no? In the, in the tutoring center? Yeah. Yes, they have slide boxes that Newton and Bender have actually given them to use. So you guys can go in, 
ask to basically see a microscope and then they'll give you a box of slides that's um, part of the same like assortment that we have. So it's kind of like if you picture the people that make the slides always take areas of the tissues that, so what I mean is when you look at a tissue under a microscope, that tissue, if you learn its characteristics, you can identify that no matter what picture you see of it. So like for me, now that I know all the tissues and I've, I knew them in the class and then I keep going over them a lot, right? Cause I've done this for a while now. When I, this doesn't come up a whole lot by the way, just to encourage everyone, but like in nursing, sometimes I'll see a picture, like they'll have a picture of like, maybe let's say a cancer uh, tissue and they'll show like, this is this epithelial tissue. And I actually can tell even now, like what that's supposed to be because I spent so much time looking at them. But if I had just studied like one example of it, like let's say I had been like, okay, well, this picture is what it looks like. You see how you wouldn't be able to see like a, someone could show you, hey, this is my cancer cell from XYZ patient. And you wouldn't be able to look at that and see why it was that because you just memorized one picture. So that's why we're making sure you guys look over it on multiple slides because then you start to figure out why that epithelial tissue is that epithelial tissue and not a different one, if that's kind of making sense to everyone. So it's not to be mean, it's because that's how you're supposed to kind of study it. So if you guys look at this tissues special terms list, again, this is the tissues checklist right here. I need to retitle it, but tissues checklist. So if you guys look at this, I made a checklist of what will be on the test for each tissue, okay? So what you need to know for the test. Because when you guys fill out this packet, it's going to feel very confusing because there's a lot of content and a lot of questions. And usually as you start filling it out, it gets very overwhelming and it's like, wait a second, what's, I don't even know what's gonna be on the test anymore. So the tissues packet is kind of like a homework assignment we have you do some extra work that's not necessarily on the test. So if you want a guidance as you're going through it of what we'll be testing you on, this is a good place to come, okay? To the tissues uh, checklist right here in the study resources module. In addition to the tissues checklist, there's also this lab exam practice PowerPoint. Each of these is broken down for you of um, exactly what we're kind of looking for um, for each area of the packet, okay? So this should help you with filling out the packet and also with preparing for your exam. When I told you guys that I said, you know, I'll, I'll do my best to help you with identifying each tissue, I've already made this PowerPoint that breaks down why each tissue looks different from other ones. So just to pull up a quick example that we already went over, for dense elastic, here are the two pictures of dense elastic. And then I have right here, when I wrote down characteristic, that means like, why does it look like dense elastic and not like a different tissue? So that's because it has this large black wavy line or lines. Does that make sense? Um, if we're looking here on dense irregular, I have that it looks like pink ribbons crisscrossing back and forth across the screen. Um, here on loose reticular, Vast amounts of dots or cells are across the slide. They look like cherry blossoms or dead cherry blossoms. So each of these is how I remember them, okay? So for dense elastic, again, characteristic large black wavy lines. And then as you get down into other tissues, I have a lot of breakdown of how I remember and differentiate each of the tissues. So this is a really good resource for you guys as you go into lab. I would recommend pulling this up when you're in lab and looking at this PowerPoint while you're looking at the tissue under the microscope. So if you guys are looking at um, simple cuboidal, pull up my picture of simple cuboidal that I have on the PowerPoint 
and then look at your slide and look at the picture because that's how we'll be testing you. So like we'll be testing you with the same type of view or the same magnification on the tissue as the pictures that I have here. Does that make sense? So for like this transitional epithelium, this would be similar, similar to a picture we'd use on the exam. But remember, it's not the same picture on the exam because we can't use the same microscope slides because we have 40 microscope slides of transitional epithelium. You don't know which one you'll get, okay? Um, would it be useful, sorry, uh, would it be useful to make this PowerPoint into flashcards? Honestly, that's not a bad idea. I would just say pull up the PowerPoint on your phone while you look over the real tissues in real life. But uh, flashcards wouldn't be a bad idea. Testing yourself with them wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, but only do that when you're not in lab. When you're, you should be trying to get as much extra lab time and going into the tutoring center as possible. All right. So let's go through how to complete the packet. So for the packet, you're going to have a tissues packet. You're only going to be doing pages one through 14. So once it gets down here into these, like, you don't need whatever is on here. They were like old images we had. You don't need them. So it ends right here with nervous tissue. So I'm going to do my best to help you guys with how to complete this. So hopefully you have this printed out and we'll go through an example. Um, the lab exam, somebody asked, is it multiple choice or is it written out? So you uh, have a variety. There are some fill in the blank questions. Um, Bender's exam possibly is still all fill in the blank. I'm not positive on that. Newton's exam is always gonna have none of these choices as one of the options. So I always say that's basically like a fill in exam. If you don't have all the options in front of you, you need to be ready for it to be a fill in exam, right? So like, for example, transitional epithelium, if we have this question on our lab exam and the options that you're given are smooth muscle, uh, reticular connective tissue, elastic, and, and cardiac, and you don't know what this is, you won't necessarily see the answer in front of you, right? You would need to choose none of these because transitional was not in front of you. Does that make sense? So please, please, please don't prepare for it to be a multiple choice exam like the multiple choice exam you took in high school right? When you guys look at this, you're not going to necessarily see that answer on those choices, and then you're going to need to choose none. So it's kind of like a fill-in. So I don't want you guys to prepare badly and think that it's going to be like a fill-in. Um, I know that on exam two, like 30 or 40 questions are fill-in, and I think some are still fill-in on this one as well. Okay, so for uh, epithelial simple squamous, so what you're going to do for the packet so if you guys wanted to complete this this weekend, right, it's kind of what I'm encouraging you to do, you would, um, step one, pull up your example uh, picture slash slide. So for simple squamous epithelium, this is box 3435, right? So what you're going to do on the tissues packet is you're going to find 3435. 34, 35. Do you guys see how I have that labeled? 34, 35. Yes? So again, if you're in that Google Drive link, you're going to find 34, 35. And then you can use this picture to answer these questions. Again, this is if you want to do this this weekend. So how many layers of squamous cells can you observe on your slide? I recommend, by the way, reading through this intro and background. How many squamous cells can you see on your slide? So we can see one layer, right? Uh, this is just one layer across. We don't see multiple layers. Um, this would be uh, also one layer. I'm trying to find an example of one that is more than one layer. Um, this, this tissue would basically be more than one layer. 
Do you guys see how they're all kind of stacked on top of each other, right? So that would be more than one layer of cells versus this one here is just one layer across. So for 1A, we would be saying, and I'm trying to just break this down to show you how what, what, what type of work we're expecting. One layer. That's how we answer 1A. 1B, what is one function of this tissue? Okay. And it already tells you the answer right here. This tissue, which covers external surfaces and lines internal cavities, is composed of flat cells, which can be arranged like pavement stones. Squamous is found in one layer. And then if you go up here, in epithelial tissues, the cells are closely connected with small amounts of intracellular substance. They form the covering of the outer surface of our body, line our internal cavities, and ducts and secretory. Um, so you would just put line ducts, um, line internal cavities, secretory glands, and make up skin, right? So that would be more than enough to put for 1B. 1C, make a sketch of 10 to 15 cells and label the nucleus cell membrane and cytoplasm of one cell under low power. So what do we do? We use the picture right here, and we're gonna just draw 10 to 15 of these cells. Okay, sorry, people are going on about the recording. Um, yes, I, I can't, I don't own the Zoom meeting. I'm so sorry. If I did, I would let you guys record as much as you wanted, but I don't own it. And so you could try asking Dan. Um, maybe he will let you. I've asked him before and I haven't been able to record. So I'm guessing you guys can't, but feel free to ask, why not? So it says draw 10 to 15 cells. So on your packet, you can just draw something that looks like this. I'm trying to give you guys a clear example. So, cause usually people are really confused, like how much detail do I need to do? And then you're just gonna draw, and then it says label the cytoplasm, the nucleus and the plasma membrane. I'm pretty sure that's what it says, right? So you would label, I'm gonna put PM for plasma membrane, I'm gonna put C for cytoplasm, and then N for nucleus. You guys would write those out, but hopefully I don't need to write all those out for you guys to get the idea, right? So we've answered, where are we at? Oh, whoops, wrong thing. We've answered one C. Now obtain a slide of human lung tissue, slot 4546. By the way, I'm not gonna go through all 14 pages in case anybody's in here like getting bored already. I'm just gonna do this for one example. So just hang with me. So now obtain a slide of lung tissue, slide 4546, draw a representative of what you see. So find 4546 on this link. And this is lung tissue under low power. Do you guys see how it says 4546 low power? So you can choose low power. You go back over to your packet and it says under low power, what are the similarities, if any? So what we're looking for when we're grading this is we wanna see that you guys have answered each one. So we wanna see you say 1A, 1B, 1C, which was your drawing, which I already showed you guys how to draw that. 1B, um, this is also a drawing. 1E, you would answer what are the similarities. So this is like, you can answer in your own words. I don't know, um, both have similar looking cells, but frog skin has no gaps and lung tissue has open circles. 1F, uh, put that away. What are the similarities under low power? And you could write any, write any similarities. We're not looking for essays. So one sentence or less, okay? Maybe two sentences as if, if you're trying to describe something. The areas that I see students lose points, okay? So hopefully that explains how to kind of do it. Um, so if you guys are working on your um, 
your area here, you're going to want to make sure that you answer every question. So I see students a lot. This happened a lot. I, I used to grade. I don't grade now. Obviously, Julian's Julian, Julianne's our grader. Um, but when I graded, I saw a lot of people not write an answer. So they thought that we weren't looking because this is 14 pages. Um, some students, because they hear us say, you know, it's more kind of on how much effort we see you put into it. So they heard that and they're like, oh, okay, great. They're just going to scroll through it and see if we did it and we're good. You do need to answer every single one. Okay. So we do want to see you answer 1A, 1B, 1C, 20, all of them. We're going to be checking how many there are and we're going to be checking that you wrote something for each one. The other thing is, is we know how the tissues are supposed to look. So sometimes I would see, this is like, this is probably the worst thing I saw when I was grading. And I always like kind of laugh to myself. But this is usually how you'll do it. You'll draw a circle. And the circle is kind of representative of what you see through the microscope, if that makes sense. So I saw some students literally submit. Obviously, it wasn't like electronic, but it looked like this. Is that changing? And I was like, how, how, how do you think that I'm grading this thinking that you did the work? So, this isn't our class. You don't need to draw like, you know, the most beautiful picture that I've ever seen, but at least try to make it look like what you see under the microscope. If it's a squiggly line, I don't think that you looked under the microscope, right? I want to see like, you tried to draw some cells. They don't need to look perfect, but you kind of made an effort to kind of draw some cells. Maybe for a nucleus, you just put a dot. That's fine, as long as you follow the instructions, okay? But if you write a squiggly line, I can't get anything out of that. I don't think that you did the work, right? You're probably gonna get like half points, if that. So do the work, follow the directions, answer every question, and make a drawing as best as you can. There's always going to be some students in here, you know, there's like the go-getters. When I was taking this class, I was like, I spent probably 20 hours on this packet, and I like made the most elaborate drawings that I could come up with, and in hindsight, I was really wasting a lot of time because I should have been dedicating that time to going over the tissues under the microscope, and instead I sat there making this like artsy drawing that really didn't matter. So don't spend too long on these. Draw something simple that we can figure out that you looked at it and then move on because you need to be looking at those under the microscope to be ready for the test. So don't, don't half do it, but also make sure that you don't like overdo it. Just do it simply and to the point and then move on. Okay. Um, um, I have a question. Do yeah. you recommend using color pencils to, um, to label or to, when we're drawing the cell in detail, just to like, start lit in the drawing, just do each thing a color or just pencil? Um, I don't, it depends on how you learn. I remember I did some of mine color, but like I said, I really think I spent too long on mine and I wasted my time because it, it, drawing it doesn't really teach you that much when the whole point of the exam is identifying one that looks nothing, like not nothing, but you need to identify them even though they don't all look exactly the same. So if color you feel like is gonna help you, use color but you're not gonna get extra points or get a better grade if you use color. And it's probably gonna end up wasting your time a little bit. So, so I just would, recommend just drawing and then saving the color for our notes. Yeah, probably. I, I probably wouldn't recommend, yeah, I would save the color for like when you're writing out words because it kind of makes it come alive more. And I wouldn't really probably waste your time coloring in these tissues when that's not probably what's teaching you. If you feel like you're learning, do it. You know, whatever le makes you learn. But if you don't feel like you're learning, I try not to like tell people what to do because everybody does learn differently. So I don't want to like 100% say don't color in, but I colored in and I wasted a lot of time. So don't waste your time. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so for simple, 
Let's do a simple cuboidal because I wanna just show you one that's pretty straightforward. So for this one, if we were filling out this one, we'd go to slot 40, 41. So on the tissues packet, you're gonna find number 4041. Does that make sense? 4041 right here. So now I'm, I see that this is the slide. So if you wanted to do this this weekend, you'd see this is the slide for 4041. The directions uh, end up saying, use, make a drawing uh, of the cuboidal cells around a single tubule and label the cell nucleus in tube lumen. So I wanna just show you how simple some of these are. Some of them are more complicated, but some of them are simple. So just read the directions. So if we're doing this one, it's, it's literally saying, this is what I, you should see, I should see on your paper. It says a single tube lumen. So each of these that you see are actually a, like, a, like a hose that filters inside of the kidneys. So what we're looking for looks like a donut. Do you guys see how there's like little donuts on the page? There's a lot of them, but they're each one. So your drawing would literally look like this. That's what it would look like. And then you would just be labeling, right? So this is the lumen. Lumen is like, um, if you have a hose, the part where the water is in a, in a hose, like in your yard, that's the lumen. So the lumen is the middle. This is the plasma membrane and then the nucleus. So that's it. It's as simple as that for some of them. For some of them, we ask you to do more work. If we ask you to do more work, be aware of what the question is asking. I'll show you guys now the most complicated one in the packet and then we'll kind of be done with me telling you how to complete it and hopefully you can go from there. Um, All right, so any questions on completing this or anybody who started, just let me know. If you guys have questions, just let me know. Okay, so for stratified cuboidal, this is probably the one where students get docked points the most on the packet. Um, this is probably the one where students don't really read what it's saying and it feels kind of confusing. So this is gonna be a few steps. Um, when I used to grade, if I saw a student that didn't do this one completely, I usually checked this one the most detailed and I would dock like up to five points on the packet if they weren't doing this right. Okay, so make sure you guys spend some time on this. So what you're gonna do is you're going to make a drawing of um, your textbook. So it tells you right here, figure 5.10, so you're gonna make a drawing from your textbook. Um, one drawing from your textbook, and then one drawing from the microscope, from the microscope. And the drawing from the microscope is going to have um, three slides. So the drawing from the microscope combines three slides. So it's gonna combine skin with a hair follicle, going to combine the Meisner's corpuscle and then it's going to combine the Pacinian corpuscle. So basically two drawings. One is a drawing from your textbook. The second is a drawing where you're combining three slides and you're labeling them. Does that make sense? So it kind of says that. It's just kind of hard to figure out. One of them is what you see in the microscope. The other is a copy from your textbook. I don't know why students every time just this, this feels like it's the wording must be really confusing because people just don't do it right. So two drawings, again, so we're looking on this page waiting for two drawings. So I'll show you guys how you would find the three. So again, skin with hair follicle, Meisner's and Pacinian. So Meisner's, do you guys see how it says slot uh, 4849? Pacinian says slot 67. So you're just gonna look for those. So you're basically gonna find, um, where is it at? 4849. So this is our Meisner's corpuscle. And 67 is our Pacinian corpuscle here. Okay. And then the other one that it tells us to look is slot 7576. So here's 7576. So I'm going to try to show you what I would be if I was grading 
the type of drawing I would want to see so that hopefully it makes sense. So I would expect to see the student draw a circle, right, showing me that they looked under the microscope and it looked like a circle. And then I'd kind of expect to have this like dermis squiggly line. Do you see how we have the dermis squiggly line at the top? So this is not like super clear. So again, this is why I'm trying to show you guys like an example. A hair follicle kind of looks like this. And we have one example in here, right here. So this is what the hair follicles look like. Each of these is a hair follicle. And then coming off the side of the hair follicle are these sebaceous glands. Uh, you can probably Google and find even better pictures, but you guys can kind of see them right here. Do you see them? They're kind of like these little like rounded things. So I would want to see the student um, kind of write that, like draw those and then label them. And I'll go back to it. If you guys have your packet, that would make it better, but I'll try to go back and show you guys. But so we ask you to label that sebaceous gland. Pseudoriferous glands, we don't really have a good example, but I'll just kind of show you where they would be. They're kind of deep down. Pseudoriferous glands. There's a model where we have you label them. Um, okay, and then Meisner's and Pacinian corpuscle. So that's that. Um, yes, that's that, okay. And then let's go to Meisner's and Pacinian. So here's our Pacinian corpuscle. So this detects pressure. It's located very deep down in the layer of the dermis. When you guys do your drawing from the textbook, you'll see the location of the Pacinian corpuscle. So if you're wondering why are we doing a drawing from our textbook and a drawing from the microscope, that's why. It's because we don't have a microscope slide that shows you guys all of these structures together, but they are all in your body together. So that's why you do the textbook and then you go to the slide and you kind of incorporate them all together so you can see how each one looks. Does that make sense? So Pacinian corpuscle is supposed to be located deep down in the epidermis. And then the last one is our Meisner's. And the Meisner's is located um, up through kind of on the epidermis, like up here. It's hard to, I know it's hard to envision this stuff, but um, if you go to your textbook and do that drawing, this will make more sense. I do recommend taking a picture of what I just drew um, because this is harder than you would think when you're going through it, okay? So that's how I would expect a student's drawing to look. They've labeled each part. They've incorporated um, the different areas of the drawings from the microscope. And then obviously they would have an additional drawing. And this drawing would be like, they've basically gone to their textbook and they've found that figure and they've done their best to copy it. Okay, I'm not, I'm not gonna like copy it here. It's kind of gonna take too long. But does that make sense? So two different things on that one. So that's what I mean. Some are really simple and easy to do in like one minute and some of them are gonna take you longer. This is probably the hardest one in the packet. Um, and I'll try to show you a few more that people get wrong and then we'll Um, the Math and Science Learning Center, I think Juan is the one who asked, uh, they have uh, hours where they're open. I believe it's Monday through Friday. The person who you could ask is actually the person who let you into this Zoom link. Um, he has the hours, or you can go on and Google Math and Science Learning Center for Delta, and they should have the hours posted. This question was stratified cuboidal epithelium. All right, so a few more minutes, and then we will um, kind of move on where you guys where you guys want to move on. Okay, so let's go to the bone bone question. So if you guys are on the bone question, what you're going to be doing is labeling um, a drawing from the microscope. And then this is usually an area where students miss a few points. They don't really read this. So it says, make a drawing of the bone model on the blackboard 
labeling the above. And that is this bone model. May erase this stuff. That is this bone model right here. So at the end of the packet. Okay, so if we go down. down right here, bone model on the blackboard, this is it. Good, so what you're gonna do for this question that says bone is first, you're gonna make a drawing of what you see under the microscope, which looks like this. This is bone under the microscope. So you're gonna draw that. Then you're gonna make a drawing of the actual bone on the blackboard, which is just, a model which is linked right here, bone model on the blackboard. Does that make sense? So you're making two drawings here. And then finally for blood, this one gets a little confusing for students as well. You're actually just drawing the models for blood. So you're not gonna be drawing, um, let me see, slot observe with high magnification, yeah. Drawing of the five CV. Okay, so one drawing, sorry, you are doing two drawings. So one drawing here is going to be of what you see under the microscope with all the cells, and you're going to label them. Like you're going to label them with these three. I'm just trying to go through it quickly. So then here, you're going to use your white blood cell models. So I've shown you guys those really quickly, but there are five white blood cell models, and that's what you're gonna use. I also have them linked in the same Google Drive link. And then this is a picture where I have them labeled for you guys, right? So you guys can use, if you want, you could just actually use this picture and draw it, but just know you will be tested on these on the lab exam. Okay, so I recommend looking at these as well. But for your packet, you guys can actually just go right here and draw what you see. Does that make sense? Again, for blood, it says right here for 3J, draw, uh, draw, make a drawing of the five types of white blood cells. So those are these, one, two, three, four, five. This is a red blood cell up here. So five types of white blood cells. And then for neuron, uh, you're just, you can also use a model for the neuron. I think I attached one right here. So you can use this neuron model if you'd like to draw the neuron. All right. So hopefully that cleared it up. There are quite a few, right? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. So there are 22 tissues, 22 tissues you need to distinguish on the exam, All right? So that's kind of how to do your homework. So this is worth 25 points. Um, you complete it like I showed you. I highly would say if you wanna get ahead and really be prepared for next week, get your lectures watched and complete your packet over the weekend. Then on Monday, when you go to lab, you're ready to start like reviewing. Does that kind of make sense? It's not reviewing. It's more like studying them and figuring out why they look different versus sitting there and wasting your two or three hours or whatever it is, just answering questions, right? So use your time wisely is what I'm trying to encourage you guys. Okay. On the test, you're getting ready to identify. So you need to tell me what tissue is this, right? So if I pull up, um, if we show you guys in just a microscope slide, which is all you're gonna get, you're not gonna get anything else, right? And all the microscope slide has is just this picture. Can you walk up to a microscope without anything except a picture and tell me what that is? right, just the slide under the microscope, can you say, yes, that's cardiac muscle, yes, that's smooth muscle, yes, that's transitional, 
you guys have 22, 22 options, right? It's a multiple choice, but it always has none of these and some of them might be fill in. So can you pick out out of 22 options, which one that is, okay? So I'm almost done kind of going over tissues, but I wanna make sure this is clear. So on the test, it's a slide under the microscope and we can ask, what is this tissue? So that's one thing we could ask you, but we can also ask you, where is this tissue located? So let's say you walk up and again, there's 22 examples, right? 22 types of tissue. You walk up and you're like, oh, well, I, I got it. I got it. I know this is elastic cartilage and you're so excited and you look at the options and the question doesn't say, what is this tissue? The question says, where is this tissue located? We might not even ask you what the tissue is. We might just jump straight to saying, okay, well, I know that this student might be able to identify elastic cartilage, but can they even tell me where it is? So you, you look at the options and you, and you don't see elastic cartilage, you just see all these different body locations ana anatomically, and you're like, whoa, I didn't, all I knew was which one it was, right? So you do need to know what it is and then the location that that tissue is found, okay? And then the third option, and this is where you're like, oh gosh, I'm overwhelmed. But the third option is we might ask you special structures. So we might not say, what is this tissue? We might not say, where is it located? We might just say, what is the name of the cell, right? Name of the cell found in this tissue. Or what is the structure at the end of the pointer? Okay, so if you don't know that it's elastic cartilage and you don't know where it's found, uh, you might also need to know, right, what the name of the cell or what the tissues are in it. So for example, since we're on elastic cartilage and that's the one I'm talking about, for that example, when you're looking at an elastic cartilage um, slide, I already gave you guys a lot of these answers here in this PowerPoint. So location that we are looking for on the test, ears and epiglottis. When you guys get to your exam, that's the location we're going to be testing you on. The cell, chondrocyte. That's the cell we're going to be testing you on. The protein, elastic fibers. Okay, so this PowerPoint is like a cheat sheet with visual. And again, this list here in this Google Doc is another cheat sheet of what we'll be testing you on. So for like smooth muscle, we want you to know that the shape of the cell is called fusiform, okay? So this is like your guide along with the PowerPoint of what is on the test. Again, tissues packet you need to complete and then those are your guides of what's on the lab exam. Um, all right, any questions? I know that you're probably feeling overwhelmed. Hopefully I overwhelmed you in advance and not the weekend before the test. So you have time to study. Unlike me, I had my test on Monday for nursing school and I got really overwhelmed like two days ago. And I was like, oh gosh, I was like, I haven't studied enough. So hopefully you're overwhelmed far enough in advance that you have time to study it all before the test, right? Before you get overloaded the weekend before. Function, somebody asked about functions. Yes and no. Um, so read this list carefully and read the PowerPoint and that should guide you to um, whether or not we want to know functions. So right here it says like for stratified squamous you'll see that nowhere on here did I write function um, but for simple columnar epithelium there are villi goblet cells, microvilli, you do need to know their functions. So specific functions for specific things, not functions on every single one. So like for stratified cuboidal, know the function. Simple cuboidal, you should know its basic function. But on some of the slides, we don't have any functions. So like um, skeletal muscle, we don't need, you don't need to know its function. Does that make sense? So read this one and also look at your PowerPoint. 
Um, most of the time I give you guys exactly what we're looking for on the test on this PowerPoint. So I'm trying to find my simple cuboidal, simple columnar slide. Um, right here, so for simple columnar, right here I have all the functions already for you, exactly like we'd want them. So goblet cells function, secrete mucus. Simple columnar cells function, absorption of nutrients. Lacteal um, function is absorb fatty acids. So it's like absorb into simple columnar cells function, absorb nutrients into a lacteal, that's absorbing fatty acids, or into a capillary bed, which absorbs nucleic acids, proteins, and carbs. Villi function, increased surface area, microvilli function, slow food down for absorption. All right, any other questions for the lab exam? So again, lab exam, you're gonna have, the majority is going to be lab exam, majority is the tissue identification, tissue location, tissue special structures. That's like, I would say 60% of the exam. And then you have probably 20% of the exam. I don't know, I don't know percentages, but you also have the metric conversions. We're definitely going to have you measure a line, weigh something, and uh, me uh, measure uh, liquid. Remember, these would be two questions each. So this is six questions minimum on metric conversions. Six questions minimum times two points per question, minimum of 12 points on metric. So that's a letter grade. If you guys don't study metric, it's an automatic letter grade that you don't get, right? Automatically, like if you got every other question right, you wouldn't. So just study metric is what I'm trying to say. Microscope, remember that's parts of the microscope and then length and width of the paramecium. And then mitosis would be the phases of mitosis. And um, then we have all the models, right? There are 10 models. So together that makes up the lab exam. All right, questions. Remember that this is all live stuff. So like you can touch the model, you can touch the microscope, they'll be all around the room and you'll like walk around the room and you'll have a piece of paper that you carry around the room and you'll look into the microscope and answer the question and then walk to a different part of the room, look in the microscope, answer a question and walk. Does that make sense? You're kind of like moving around the room while you answer all the questions. Okay. All right, so I'm thinking about doing the rest of the lecture portion, like mitosis, if that sounds good, or I can do a few models and then do mitosis. Do you guys want a few models and then mitosis? Like the cell model, and I could do probably the cell, mitochondria, phospholipid bilayer, and then go to, yes. All right, um, so let's do the cell. I don't think, I didn't do the cell, right? Sometimes my semesters do run together. I'm like 99% sure I didn't do it this semester. I didn't, right? I don't think I did. did I? Okay, I, think I, I don't think I did the... Someone said start with the most difficult. Uh, I will just, I'll just do these quickly. These are, these are easier than the, um, than the lecture. The lecture is, is, don't get, don't get too focused on lab exam and forget about the lecture. Hopefully I didn't overwhelm you so much for the lab exam that you guys don't study the lecture because that takes a lot of people by surprise, the lecture. So keep going with your notes. Keep going with reviewing your notes each weekend for the lecture exam. Um, sometimes I spend more time on lab a little bit in the beginning because it's kind of hard to figure out what you're supposed to be doing, but the le lecture exam, don't underestimate that. 
All right, so for the cell, when you guys are looking at this, we want you guys to identify the nucleolus, right, in the very center. Then you have the nucleus, which would be the entire structure. We have those nuclear pores. So some of this is good because it gives us a visual um, before we cover it in a minute. So nuclear pores, these are uh, holes through the double membrane around the nucleus, okay? Um, then we have, your, you can kind of see your DNA or your chromatin floating in the middle of that um, nucleoplasm, right? DNA, chromatin floats in nucleoplasm. So remember that's where our DNA is stored. Then we have our centrosome. So the black equals the centrosome. And then the yellow, orange, little like matchstick things are two centrioles. So each one would represent one centriole. And then when we talk about them together, we call them a centrosome. Does that make sense? Two centrioles equals one centrosome. This is the mitochondria. Um, some of these, it would be good to know a function. Other ones, you don't really need to know a function. So what's the function of the mitochondria? It is double membraned. You need to know that, which we already said last uh, SI session. And then it um, does cellular respiration, right? So for the lab exam functions, if we ask them, we, we're looking for more basic functions. Nucleolus makes ribosomes. Whereas the lecture exam, we're wanting a lot more detail, which is why you guys spend that time on those notes, right? To get that detail we want. Lysosome function there would be intracellular digestion. Um, peroxisome function would be to um, convert hydrogen peroxide oxide into water. I'm just going to put two H2O. I think most of us know what water is, right? Um, Golgi right here, this purple, purple structure is the Golgi apparatus. And then coming off of the Golgi apparatus are these little dots. Those are our vesicles. Remember we had secretory vesicles and then Remember that if one stayed inside the cell, what did it become? Became a lysosome, right? Um, that, that's probably going to be on your lecture exam. So if that didn't sound familiar, go over your notes, right? If a Golgi secretes something, a vesicle to leave the cell, we call that a secretory vesicle. And then if it stays inside the cell, we call that a lysosome. So that's the intracellular digestion lysosome. This is rough endoplasmic reticulum. Remember the function of that would be to transport proteins. Um, remember endoplasmic reticulum, right? Series of tubes and channels for the transport of proteins and other substances. So for rough, it transports proteins. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum is the part that you see that doesn't have those white dots. So if it has white dots, Remember, those represent ribosomes, and that's why it's rough. If it doesn't have white dots, it would be smooth. And remember that smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the function there is, um, is for the metabolism of lipids. So I'm just going to write lipids because I don't have enough room, but basically smooth ER functions for lipids. FX's function. Okay, so that should be everything that we see. Um, again, what are the white dots on the surface of the rough ER? Those are ribosomes, right? So we may ask you that. What are those? Ribosomes. 
Any questions at all on this model? Everybody get a picture of it. So you can keep that somewhere in case you need to label it later. I would recommend keeping, keeping that somewhere. Um, sorry, let me erase this down here. Good. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and erase this. Okay, so that was the cell. So let's just do, uh, we'll just do a little more. Let's do the mitochondria really quick and the phospholipid bilayer. And then we'll go over and do the mitosis. So this is the mitochondria, right? This one's a very simple one. So uh, it's a, like really easy to learn. Uh, again, different stuff is on the test every semester. So this could very well be on your test. Um, this is the matrix. So basically each of these folds, so the mitochondria kind of folds up and we call that the matrix. So the matrix folds of the mitochondria to increase surface area. So the mitochondria kind of folds up to increase that surface area. And then we have these little crystal look like little ball-like crystals. And these are called cristae. So it's kind of makes sense. And these are the site of cellular respiration. Good, so that's everything for the mitochondria. So the whole thing's the mitochondria, the matrix are the folds to increase surface area, and the cristae are the site of the actual cellular respiration. And remember cellular respiration is what? the creation of ATP, which is cellular energy, right? Cellular respiration, creation of ATP, which is cellular energy. All right, so let's do a quick little practice question over here. So what are the three double membrane things inside of a cell? I'll give you guys a few, few options. So is it nucleus? Um, nucleus, plasma membrane, and um, All right, so let's all answer that question. Oh, oh no. Well, looks like I have to type it again, okay. This eraser on this Zoom, it literally, it's actually enough to make me scream sometimes, it's so horrible. So I'll just try to abbreviate nucleus, PM, lysosome, Nucleus, PM, peroxisome. I don't even know what I had put. Nucleus, um, PM, mitochondria, mitochondria, oxisome, isosome. Okay, none. All right. So, what is our what are our choices here? Everybody, why don't we all answer in the chat? Good, getting more answers over here. Good, okay, so everybody's getting it right. So C, nucleus, plasma membrane, and the mitochondria. This is um, just kind of a reminder of like, I didn't use it this time, but remember that E, none of these could come into play if none of the correct answers were there, and then you guys would need to recognize that that's not right. But good, so those are the three double membrane things in a cell, good job. So C was the answer to that, great.
All right, so let's do phospholipid bilayer, and then we'll we'll get it, get our little run through mitosis. So as we look here, um, this is our representative of the phospholipid bilayer. Um, we see the two layers of phospholipids. So this would be layer number one, and this is layer number two. Remember, because we have two sets of phospholipids. So remember how I told you that the phosphate head is polar, hydrophilic, okay? So it's water loving. And it's also charged water loving. So all of that would be the stuff you would wanna know for the lab exam and for the lecture exam about the properties of the phosphate head. For the fatty acid tails, we know that those are lipid. Lipids, we know that they are non-charged. We know that they are hydrophobic, which means they fear water. So you wanna know all of those properties, right? So all of that stuff could be something we put on that multiple choice on the test, which of these is true about a fatty acid tail, right? Which is not true of a fatty acid tail. And then we would say maybe hydrophobic, non-charged, uh, right? Uh, lipids, polar, nonpolar, and E, none. So in this, we would choose B, right? Because they are not charged. But if we said that they were not charged, our answer would be E because all of them would be true. Does that make sense? So make sure you're very careful on your lab exam. Read every single one because maybe all of them are not true. And so we need to actually go towards all of them being not true. Thank you so much to Michaela for recording. I really appreciate it. And if anybody else got the recording too. Okay, good. So this isn't too complicated, but you would need to know those, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and do our mitosis and then we'll be done. So uh, next week on Monday, Hopefully I can get to some more of the models and we'll also do meiosis. Good. Any questions that I can answer before we go into the lecture side of things? All right, so um, remember we had kind of done our little outline and I'm not gonna do a lot of detail just because of time constraints, but just to kind of give us a little reminder, we had said the cell had three parts. There was the plasma membrane, the cytoplasm and the nucleus, right? So we had already done the cytoplasm and the plasma membrane and I already kind of did the breakdown of all that so we won't we don't have time to recap and we won't go over it again, but if you um, missed it, um, I know that somebody got the recording, I think. So anyway, I need to work and look, look into that. If you didn't get the recording or you weren't here, let me know and I can try to figure out if somebody got that. But for the nucleus component, we're gonna be looking at the three components, which are the nuclear envelope, right? And remember that, um, not that that's why you're leaving, but I'm only going to spend like three or four minutes on the nucleus because I want to go to the mitosis. So don't, if you feel like the nucleus makes sense, we're not really going to spend a lot of time on it because it's, it's not too complicated. So the nucleus basically has these three components. It has the nuclear envelope, the nucleolus, and then the DNA, which is in the nucleoplasm. So in a sense, the nucleus has the same three parts as the cell. Do you guys see how it has a nucleoplasm that has the DNA, a nucleolus, which is like its nucleus, and then a nuclear envelope. So the cell, right, this is the cell, it had the plasma membrane, the cyto, and then the nucleus. But then the nucleus has a nuclear envelope, which is the same basically as a 
plasma membrane of the nucleus. It's double membrane. So that's like the same exact thing. It has nuclear pores, which I already labeled for you on the model. These allow ribosomes and um, basically DNA to leave the cell. So this is the nuclear envelope of the cell, and then the nucleolus is all the way in the inside of the nucleus. And then we have our little DNA kind of floating in the nucleoplasm. Okay, so nuclear pores allow ribosomes and DNA to leave, and these make the nucleus selectively permeable, right? So it's, it's allowing certain things to come in and allowing certain things to go out. The nucleolus produces ribosomes, produces ribosomes. So remember that ribosomes make protein. So the DNA in the nucleoplasm is basically made of, DNA is made of nitrogen bases, and we call these adenosine, I um, believe it's thymine, there we go, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. So these are our, our four nitrogen bases, and these um, get together based off of complementary base pairing. So A always goes with T, and G always goes with C. So this is how DNA duplicates or replicates. So basically what we're saying is, if you're in S phase, remember S phase that you guys have already touched on because you did your mitosis packet. So remember how we say, and we're gonna get into this in just a second, but S phase duplicates DNA, right? Remember how you guys have already learned about that. So the way that it works is we have like a little strand of DNA right? You've kind of all seen it. It actually looks like, it has this like weird double helix shape that kind of looks more like this. Okay, so on the shape of the DNA, it's basically across from each other. Each of them duplicate. So some of this should be a little familiar to some of you guys, but basically A will always go with T, G always goes with C, um, and basically so on and so forth. So if I cut them apart, which is what happens with cellular replication. So there's this substance that comes through and cuts them apart. And then what you end up with is they're like alone and by themselves, right? So we have this one strand over here and this one strand over here. When you duplicate or replicate DNA, it's really easy for the body to do it because it knows what's supposed to go there because of complementary base pairing, where A always goes with T, and then G always goes with C. Does that make sense? So basically, it's able to create duplicate copies because of the fact that those always go together. So this is the concept of complementary base pairing, which um, probably could be a question. Um, I'm not like going to say with 100% certainty but I don't want you guys to totally miss out on the concept because I feel like it's kind of important. It's not too complicated. Just know complementary base pairing is that A always goes with T, G always goes with C, and it allows the cell to know what fills in the gap so that it can just quickly replicate that. Does that make sense? So that's how S phase replicates or duplicates that DNA, okay? You don't need to know which ones are purines and which ones are pyrimidines. That's not, um, it's not a necessary thing to know. Okay, so uh, genes and chromatin and chromosomes. So remember, we kind of had talked about this. Gene, the definition of a gene is enough nitrogen bases for a trait. So the gene for brown hair would be enough nitrogen bases to make that trait. If it's chromatin, chromatin is the name for relaxed or unoiled DNA. And then chromosome is our name for DNA in, um, 
in anaphase when the two strands pull apart. We call that a chromosome. And we're about to go into the different phases of mitosis right now. So what we just talked about was the nucleus, and we basically just did a quick uh, coverage of nuclear envelope, nucleolus, and then DNA. Talked a little bit about the terminology for DNA, and now we're going to go into the different phases of mitosis and how the cell replicates. Good? All right. So we're talking about the life cycle of the cell. So we know that there's interphase, right? Before we get to mitosis, we know that there's interphase. Interphase has the three substages. It's going to have G1. And in G1, this is normal metabolic activities, right? So on your test, what is G1? G1 is the first phase of interphase. During G1, normal metabolic activities occur. So examples of this are normal cell growth replication of the organelles, right? And that's in preparation for basically just the normal things that the cell is doing. We're not replicating yet. We're not doing anything yet. And it's producing proteins for replication. So most of the time, the cell is in G1. So this is really cool. I think this is really cool. So we just in nursing school right now, we're learning about cancer. So when somebody has cancer, you guys have probably heard of chemotherapy, right? They get chemotherapy, which is like really strong drugs or medicine that tries to kill the cancer. Well, the chemotherapy only works when the cells are dividing. So chemotherapy which this isn't on your test, so like don't write the chemo down, but chemo only works on S phase and mitosis, right? S phase, G2, and then the phases of mitosis because that's when the cell is dividing. So if the cell spends most of the time in G1 and chemo can only kill cancer cells when they're in S, G2, and mitosis, do you see how chemo, why chemo takes a long time to work, why you have to give it to somebody for a long time? Because you don't just give it to them and it automatically works because most of their cells spend most of the time in G1 and we have to wait until they're in S, G2, or mitosis. That's why they give people chemo and then they come back a month later and then they give them chemo again and then they come back a month later and give it again because we're waiting for those cells to get out of G1 and start replicating. I think it's interesting because it's like an example of how anatomy keeps following you as you go on. And you'd think that in nursing, it's like, oh, well, you'd be done with mitosis. And it's like, no, you understand and remember mitosis and you understand this concept. It is important later. It is something you remember later. And when you're talking to your patient who you're giving chemo to maybe, you could be saying, hey, like, this is what happens in your cells. All of your cells spend most of their time kind of resting and relaxing. And then we give you this medication. We're waiting for them to go into this, like, process where they duplicate themselves, which doesn't happen that often. So we have to keep giving you your chemo every month. Does that make sense? So it's like, if you keep that knowledge going, it keeps following you and it, it's useful. So for S phase, remember, this is DNA replication. So this is when the cell goes through this process and it actually replicates or duplicates the chromatin. So chromatin is replicated. So G1, we have chromatin. Remember, chromatin is uncoiled, relaxed, DNA. S phase, we have DNA replication. Chromatin is replicated. And we call the replicated chromatin sister chromatids. So in G1, it kind of looks like, let's draw the DNA in a different color. DNA kind of looks like this. In S phase, we coil the DNA around. And we call them sister chromatids. So chromatin is replicated and coiled around histones, which are like proteins, okay? 
And then at the center of each sister chromatid, we have the Kanita core, Kanita shore, Kanita core. And these hold each um, sister chromatid, uh, keeping it coiled. So they're going to keep those sister chromatids coiled up. Yes, you need to know what a Kanita core is for the test. Around the Kanita cores is the centromere. And the centromere um, holds, I'm going to try to use a different word here, ties the sister chromatids together, ties the sisters together. Centromere and Kanita core. So centromere ties the um, sisters together, Kanita core holds each one to itself. G2 is when the centrioles replicate and the cell prepares to divide. Okay, so we may have other organelle production. So S is when the DNA specifically replicates, forming the sister chromatids. G2 is when everything else gets ready. So everything else besides the DNA gets ready to divide. So then we go into the actual mitosis, right? So mitosis is the actual dividing of the cell. The end result of mitosis, right, is two daughter cells. And I had already told you guys this earlier, right? Genetically, like their DNA is identical to the parent because of the complementary base pairing, right? Where we say A is always a T, G always goes with C, all of that. But the size is half the size. So they're actually half the size of the parent cell. Excuse me, I have a question. Yeah. Um, what does it say after G2? Does it say two centrioles replicate? And uh, what does that say? I'm sorry, I can't read it. Uh, this is and centrioles replicate and the cell prepares to divide organelle production. Okay, thank you. I didn't know, sorry, which part we were on there. And if anybody can't read my writing, like I said, it's always hard with the iPad. And I think my handwriting is getting worse and worse the more I write, so just let me know. Um, okay. So then we're the, we get into the actual phases of mitosis, right? So let's do those. We'll just start with prophase here. It's fine. So prophase is first. Remember, it goes P, mat, right? Prophase is first. Um, what happens in prophase overall? We kind of, let's just draw a few sister chromatids. So prophase kind of looks like this. We just have this, the sister chromatids basically all over the cell. A few other things that are happening. So things happening. The sister, it says sisters, sister chromatids are at random locations. I already told you that they have the centromere and the kinetic core. Okay, I'm not going to re-explain that, but sister chromatids are at random locations all over the cell. The nucleolus is disappearing, so that means that where the nucleolus kind of was, used to be around them, is starting to disappear. And then the centrioles, we'll write slash centrosomes, migrate to the poles of the cell. Uh, you know the term like North Pole, South Pole, like the top of the uh, earth and the bottom. So we have poles in the cell. So if we picture the cell being a little bigger, here would be centrioles. This is my centriole. Remember how I said there was two and together they were a centrosome? So they go to the opposite ends of the cell. And the next thing that happens is the asters appear. The asters join the centriole to 
the plasma membrane. So the asters are like, kind of like these little lines will be asters. So I'll try to draw like an arrow. Centrioles would be these guys right here. And then nucleolus disappearing was just kind of like this little part. And then we have, the last thing is that the spindle apparatus appears. So I'm gonna erase this so I have just a little more room. spindle apparatus, which is our microtubules that extend from the centrioles. And these are called spindle fibers, okay? So these two are the same. So spindle fibers extend from the centrioles so they kind of look like this, like little spider webs, and they kind of extend out. So those are the one, two, three, four, five, five things that happen in our, um, in our prophase. What do the spindle fibers attach to? The spindle fibers attach to the kinito core. So on, remember, on each of these little sister chromatids, I drew it up here, there was that little kinito core, right? So that's what those spindle fibers attached to. So the centromere just holds the two sisters together. Mm -hmm. okay. um, like a, if you took two human beings and you tied a belt around them and like you grabbed onto their t-shirt, like they're still held together by that centromere belt, but like the spindle fibers is like an arm grabbing onto like a t-shirt and the t-shirt would be like the kinetochore, but they're still held together by the centromere. It's just that it's like a belt kind of holding them together. And then the spindle fibers is grabbing onto the t-shirt. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, let's do metaphase. So I'll just redraw the cell too, a little bigger. So asters are here, right? Centrioles, centriole centriole and then we have two so that's why i draw them crisscross like that because it's supposed to represent two and remember when we talk about them together it's a centrosome extending out from them is the spindle fibers and the spindle fibers are we'll put the word of or let's say make up the spindle apparatus okay so those extend out and what do those connect to? They connect to the individual kinetochores, right, on each sister chromatid, okay? And like I had just said, remember the sister chromatids are still held together. Let's see, what color should I use? Um, let's use black. So holding them together still is the centromere. The centromere is not letting the sister chromatids apart, okay? But the spindle fibers are attached to the kinetochore core of each sister chromatid. So now we're in metaphase. And the only difference really between metaphase and prophase is that the um, chromatids line up 
at the middle. And in the cell, we call the middle the equator. So you know how, again, these are the poles of the cell, pole, like a north pole and a south pole. If you know anything about geography, you know that the middle of the earth is the equator, right? So it's like we use the same geography as the earth. So the chromatids line up at the equator, which is the middle. Um, okay, and then the other thing is that the asters and the spindle apparatus are formed completely in metaphase. So they were like kind of starting in prophase, now they're formed completely. And then the other thing is that the nucleolus has now disappeared. Okay, so that would be metaphase. Moving on to anaphase, so I'll just kind of draw it here and then I'll erase some of the metaphase uh, words. So we're going to have the same structures again, asters, centriole, centrosome, spindle fibers attached to our kinetophore of each individual sister chromatid, and I'll just draw them a little bit more simply, okay? But in anaphase, as you guys probably have already gone over, right? In anaphase, the big thing here is that the centromere breaks. So what happens is the spindle fibers actually shorten and break the centromere. So when the centromere breaks, as the spindle fibers shorten, we call the spindle, uh, the sister chromatids, um, chromosomes. So the sister chromatids are renamed chromosomes. So only in anaphase do we call the sister chromatids chromosome. Good? So metaphase, anaphase. They are now pulled apart because the centromere broke. And we're almost there, right? Telophase, we get the actual, like, starting to see those cells. Those two new cells are starting to look like they might form here. Um, we have the little, yes, I will go back just now. Someone said go back, so we'll go back real quick. Did you get it okay? Perfect. Okay, so in telophase, these are the things that we see in telophase. The asters, the spindle apparatus and the kinetochore all disappear. So remember, what did we say the function of the kinetochore was? It held the sister chromatid like together, right? Uh, keep, it kept it coiled. So the sister chromatid looked like this, right? It was kind of coiled up around what we said were called histones. And that was the kinetochore that kept it coiled. And there were little histones in the sister chromatid. So it was coiled around histones. That is not spelled right, coiled. So when we lose the kinetochore, the sister chromatid it, like relaxes. Does that make sense? It's not kept coiled up anymore. So the DNA is now called chromatin because whenever it's relaxed, 
it's called chromatin. Cell plate or cleavage furrow begins resulting in eventual cytokinesis when the cytoplasm divides. So this little indent is the cell plate or cleavage furrow. Cytokinesis is when two new daughter cells are formed. So cytokinesis is like the complete division. Cell plate or cleavage furrow is the start of it. And then the ending point basically of telophase would be that we have the nucleolus, nucleolus and nucleus and nuclear envelope reform around the new DNA copies, right? The nucleolus and the nucle nucleus are reforming around those DNA copies. So just to recap, and then I'll let you guys go, for G1, we have 23, uh, sorry, 46, right? We have 46 um, DNA strands. And then we duplicate or replicate that in S, and we have 92. And those would be 46 pairs of sister chromatids, right? Because it's like 40, 92 divided by 2 is 46 pairs. So we originally had 46 chromatin, 46. Let me see if I can, let's do it in blue. 46 chromatin replicates and becomes 92, uh, 92 as 46 sister chromatid pairs. So it's still 46 sister chromatid pairs equaling 92 when we're in G2 and when we're in prophase, right? So both G2 and prophase would be 92. We go into metaphase and we still have 92 as 46 sister chromatid pairs, but now they are at the equator, still the same thing. In anaphase, they pull apart and they're renamed the chromosome, right? So now we have, um, basically it would be like 92 chromosomes. 46 would be on this side, 46 on this side, but they're still all together in the same cell. When we get into telophase, again, they're still not completely separated. This side, we have 46 chromatin. Remember, it's not called the chromosome anymore or a sister chromatid because the kinetochore broke. On this side, it's 46 chromatin. So in the daughter cell, we end up with 46 chromatin and 46 chromatin. And each of these goes into G1, right? It goes into its normal process, G1. So then it would repeat again and it would go 46 and then it would start into S phase for each of those. So that's how the process of mitosis goes. Um, resulting in where are we? Resulting in eventual, eventual. I don't know if that helped any, but eventual cytokinesis when the cytoplasm divides. Nucleolus and nuclear envelope reform around the new DNA copies. All right, any questions at all? I know that that was a pretty quick uh, coverage of mitosis, but hopefully that helped um, cement it for you. And then remember on Monday, we're gonna cover meiosis. So that's why I needed to make sure we did mitosis today. Uh, Monday, we're gonna do meiosis. We're gonna do female and male.
Okay, so it gets kind of detailed, so be ready for that. We're also going to go over some more models and um, probably. All right, thank you guys so much for coming. I'm here until noon, so don't leave if you have questions, okay? So anybody who wants to stay can stay, but if not, I'll see you Monday.